There are some fundamental differences that make the Palo Alto Networks Next Generation Firewall unique. In this video, I will show you the core features. If this is your first time here, I'm Lars von Consigas. We call ourselves the Palo Alto Networks Experts because the Next Generation Firewall is our passion. It's what we do all day every day, migrating firewalls, providing managed services and most important, implementing security best practices. When I started to work with this box in 2010, barely anyone knew about Palo Alto Networks. But as an engineer I felt that this solution will change the world of cybersecurity. And yes, today we know it did big time, because it's one of the few security solutions that can truly secure your network. However, there's a caveat. You need to set it up in the right way in order to be effective. Because while it's awesome, it's not a magic box. So over the years we became a professional service partner for Palo Alto Networks, as well as one of a few elite authorized training centers. And was working in the field for so many years and being a trainer, I would like to share my experience with you. So over the next couple of weeks and months, we release new videos and core concepts explaining the fundamental workings of the next generation firewall, starting with the trend landscape, then deployment methods, NAT, AppID, SSL decryption, VPNs, and many more. So follow us on LinkedIn, YouTube or Twitter to stay up to date. But now let's get started on the core features. When we look at the requirements on what is the firewall supposed to do, we can identify three main requirements. First of all, visibility. We want to see what is going over the network. Then control. We want to control who is allowed to do what. And we obviously want to prevent threats. Okay. Now, if we look at the internet, then 10, 20 years ago, there were only really two applications, right? There were kind of static web pages and email. And with this, a firewall simply made the assumptions that a port equals an application. Meaning, you know, port 25, ah, okay, that's email. Port 80, ah, okay, that's, this is kind of web browsing. Nowadays, with, you know, SaaS applications, um, this assumptions, a port equals application, that's no longer the case. And a firewall effectively looks like this, right? So port 80, port 443, you know, these ports are allowed. And with this, you know, a firewall completely loses its visibility because it can no longer distinguish between the different applications because all of the applications obviously use the same uh, ports, right? So is this the first uh, feature what we have on our Palo Alto Next Generation Firewall is App ID. We identify the application and what we mean with an application we can see here in uh, our Applipedia. Okay, so first of all, from a definition point of view, there isn't really a kind of a, a full definition of what is an application. But from a Palo Alto Networks point of view, is uh, basically every communication which goes over the network is identified as an application. Okay, so and when we look at you know an example like uh, Facebook, for instance, we can see it is not only you know Facebook; it's Facebook Mail, chat apps, posting, right? So from a visibility point of view, we can really see what people are doing, and from from a control point of view, we can also now control what are they allowed to do, right? So for instance, you know, block access to social media, but allow the so the, the marketing department, for instance, to access uh, Facebook chat. Okay, um, if we take kind of other examples like uh, something more kind of corporate wise like uh, SharePoint for instance, we can see exactly the same thing, right? So it's kind of we have a main application which are then also segregated down here. And these are not only web applications, right? And here we find things like Microsoft SQL, uh, BitTorrent, so really any type of communication which goes over the network uh, is identified as an application. Obviously. Palo Alto Networks cannot identify every application, right? But for everyone, everything we cannot identify or what cannot be identified out of the box, we can also de uh, define custom applications, right? So with this, we are in effect able to identify 100% of applications. Now, um, when it comes to App ID, it is very important that the technology behind it, it is not that easy, right? So classic identification of applications done via signatures, right? And that's Depends, usually straightforward. But then there are also applications like Skype or encrypted BitTorrent, which are evasive, means they're changing all the time, right? And here, Palo Alto Networks also has heuristics, so kind of a behavior based detection of the application. So the technology behind it, you know, is actually quite sophisticated. Now, the other thing what we often forget. And uh, when it comes to visibility is that behind the PC, they're sitting a user. But on our firewalls, what do we usually have? We have policies based on IP addresses and ports. So now, uh, on our Palo Alto, we can also identify users using user ID. Okay, so with this from a visibility point of view, we can see exactly what the individual user is doing, but then also control what 
individual users, but also group of people are allowed to do. Like I said before, you know, allowing the marketing department to access Facebook, for instance. Okay. Um, user ID is kind of done in, in different ways, so they give different sources for user ID information, right? But um, there's always kind of a way how we can identify users uh, depending on kind of the different sources where we can utilize for this, right? Classical, most classical example would be integration with Active Directory. So now we come to control. Obviously, when we define control, we do this with a policy, and that's you know the same on, on, on our next generation firewall. But the problem is that these policies often put IT in a very difficult position. Um, take for instance Gmail. Okay, Gmail you could assume is usually used for private purposes, so we can block it. Okay. On the other side, you might have this director who says, no, you have to you know give me access to Gmail, or maybe you have some you know employees who are kind of working very long hours and you simply want to give them the opportunity to check their email uh, in the in the afternoon, right? So uh, what do you do? Do you kind of allow them uh, access and we just have a productive network, productive users, but an unsecure network? Or do you block it? Because obviously email is still the biggest threat vector, means the majority of malware still comes in via email, right? And if you allow applications like Gmail, you're effectively circumventing the security of your corporate email security solution because obviously Gmail uses SSL, so encrypted traffic comes into a network and with this obviously malware can come in as well, okay? So with this, you know, maybe the better thing, better idea is to, to block it, right? And with this, you know, maybe secure an airport, but frustrate your users. So what do you do? Um, no matter what you do as IT, you know, you're always the bad boy, right? So if you always say, yeah, we can do this, not a problem, then again, you know, uh, sooner or later, you're gonna have malware in the network, and guess what, that's IT fault. On the other side, if you always say, no, we cannot do this for security reasons, then at some stage, your business gonna ask as well, and what do we need IT for? Okay, now, uh, with our next generation firewall, we can now uh, enable something or apply something what we call application enablement. Because besides just allowing and blocking everything, we can allow specific application and mitigate the risk of the application. Meaning, for instance, like Gmail, right? We allow Gmail and scanner for threats. So in particular case of Gmail, we're obviously also decrypting the SSL traffic. Look inside of the SSL and then scan this traffic uh, for antivirus, anti-spyware, or any other kinds of threats, right? So we're effectively allowing the application, but we mitigate the risk associated with the application, right? So with this, um, we don't have to be always the, you know, the security uh, IT stopper anymore and saying, no, we cannot do this, right? So we, we can now say, yes, yes, we can do it, and we can secure it as well, okay? So beside this, there are much more other things what we can do as well, like, for instance, uh, apply quality of service. Now, quality of service, people often know from prioritizing voice and this kind of stuff, right? But here now with our next generation firewall, because we identify applications, we can also bring quality of service to a completely different level, because now what we can do is basically apply quality of service based on the application. So for instance, prioritizing business critical applications like Office 365 over bandwidth consuming applications like YouTube, right? So with this is a decision, you know, we, maybe you say, right, oh, YouTube, oh, we don't need it. Let's block it because it just saturates our, our bandwidth. We don't need to do this anymore. We don't have to be this restrict anymore if we apply quality of service, okay? Then there are functions, like we said before, you know, allowing specific functions to specific users, right? And um, there's also functionality for the scan for confidential data. So the keyword here is DLP, data loss prevention. Now, it's not a full-blown DLP solution, but it, it does provide the basic functionality, which is effectively scanning traffic for unique patterns, uh, what we can define in, in, in a signature, okay? So, and then maybe another example, um, allowing specific access at uh, specific times. So here the classic example would be, for instance, to give access to Facebook uh, during lunchtime, right? So with this, you can see there's a much more now granular visibility and this visibility we can now use uh, to apply control. And this is a very important concept, right? There is no visibility without control. Right. So when we kind of look at visibility, the app ID and the user ID, these are kind of our really profound core features, which are kind of having kind of uh, defining the base. Right. Um, if we don't do this in a very profound way and it doesn't work very well, then we already fall short everywhere else. And later on, we're going to see more and more examples uh, where you can see this as well. OK, so this granular visibility and control is really key to the entire solution uh, front to start. So now we come to threat prevention. But before we talk about how to prevent malware and this, all this kind of good stuff, first of all, let's have a look at the hacker, right? Because a lot of people believe that the hacker looks like this, right? A little kid, a lonely nerd, sitting at home Friday evening, hacking a web page and leaving a message, I was here. 
right? So effectively, a single individual just doing it out of prestige. And to be honest, this was like this 10, 20 years ago, where hackers were mainly kind of smart guys who wanted to show off their skills. But this time has changed, right? So now hackers more look like this, right? They're not single individuals anymore. They're now groups of people. And their main interest is no longer prestige. It is money. Or to be fully correct, we kind of differentiate three different groups, right? There are country states, then there are politically motivated groups like anonymous, and then there are the cyber criminals. And the cyber criminals are usually kind of the ones which cause most damage to enterprises, and that's the one which we would like to focus on, okay? Now, when we look at the news, everything seems to be hackable, and everything seems to be kind of easy. And uh, we have kind of an example here. Um, <clears throat> from Unit 42. Unit 42 is an um, threat intelligence group inside of Palo Alto Networks. And uh, what these guys are doing is basically not only analyze threats, but also analyze the threat actors behind the threat to try to understand you know, their motivations. And in this particular example, they had a look at a hacking group in Nigeria um, who were kind of running a quite successful malware campaign. Um, and um, but it kind of pretty soon went clear that they were not very clever, right? Because they left left a lot of breadcrumbs, which made it pretty easy to identify who they were. And if we kind of scroll to the report, we can see even here this, this kind of Facebook profile of the guy showing off his money. Okay, so quite bizarre. <laughs> um, so, and that's kind of an, a very good example of the situation where we're in, right? There are people, criminals, right? who are not that skilled, don't really understand what they're doing, but at the same time making a lot of money because they're running a, a very successful malware campaign. And the question is now really, how is this possible? And it's possible because we have really seen a kind of profound change uh, in the last, I'd say, five to seven years, right? And the change is how the smart guys are kind of acting, okay? Now, put yourself into the shoes of, of a hacker. And let's say you, want to, you are one of these kind of really smart hackers who can attack absolutely everything. Okay, So you have control, you can hack into enterprises, you maybe even get access to credit card details. Okay, Now, having this kind of access or even the credit card details, that's one thing. But converting this access and the credit cards into money, what you can use in real life, that's a complete different game. And that's usually the step where the risk is involved to get caught. So what are the smart guys doing now? The smart guys say, hmm, obviously they don't want to get caught, right? So I'm going to change now. I'm not going to do this, you know, hacking anymore. I am now in business kind of software development and services, okay? What does it mean? Well, I like to call this hacking as a service, okay? And I have a good example. Um, we had a customer, they were kind of a, a data center customer, and they're also kind of a uh, small ISP. And they one day kind of saw a big spike in traffic. And well, spikes in traffic are not kind of that strange for them, but um, they still kind of looked into us. And they got kind of, they was talking then to the, um, to the victim who was attacked. And it turned out that there was a guy uh, somewhere in the countryside in, in Ireland um, kind of joining in the morning a poker game. Right, and a certain kind of towards the end of the day, he actually made it to the end table. So I don't, I don't remember really the exact money, but I think it was about twenty, thirty thousand uh, dollars what they were playing for. Um, so quite a sizable amount. <clears throat> and so he was kind of playing his final final game, and then suddenly his internet stopped working. Oh, how strange! And obviously with this, his, his connection timed out, and he lost. So what happened? Well, someone bought a denial of service attack, and basically just brought down his internet connection. Bang, dead in the water. <laughs> okay, and that's really what we see today, right? Um, there's this kind of hacking as a service where you can buy an entire hack or the tools, right? And this is kind of what the smart guys are doing, right? They're kind of developing now the tools for everyone to attack. Because the one thing what we have to be clear about is uh, hacking is not simple. Right. Let's say that's kind of a new vulnerability for Flash coming out tomorrow, kind of developing a tool uh, or kind of a, um, a malware which can exploit the vulnerability and affect thousands of PCs worldwide. Um, this isn't easy stuff. Right. So what is done today uh, as part of, the, of, of, of an infiltration is really freaking complex. Right. But the big difference now is that with these tools, it makes it very simple and it creates kind of a very shocking situation. Because we have now enterprises who have all of the supposed to be, you know, 
good security tools like firewalls, your filtering proxies, antivirus, maybe even an IPS system, and are still getting attacked, okay, and infiltrated uh, and compromised. And this not only through targeted attacks, but also through commodity malware. So commodity malware, I mean stuff like, you know, ransomware, banking trojans. These are kind of hacking campaigns who don't try to attack you specifically. They are just to try to attack whomever they can, right? And they're successful with this, right? And this is kind of a shocking situation, okay? Now, I have some good news as well, because the fact that these attacks are no more, more sophisticated, it's kind of helps us as well to prevent them, right? So if we kind of look at this, usually in a first phase, there's an infection of a PC with malware. Now you might say, oh yeah, we have antivirus on all of our PCs. Now, antivirus is dead, okay? And then later on, I'm gonna show you, show, kind of explain a little bit more about this, right? Now, once the PC is infected with malware, it will try to establish a remote control channel to a command control server. So with this effectively, the hacker has now a communication channel and with this full access to the device and then from there, explore and steal, right? And again, here it's not always to be targeted and kind of attacked directly, right? You might be a small company who says, oh, you know, we're some only small company, who should attack us, right? Today, everyone is a target, at least of these indirect attacks, right? Of from commodity malware, uh, which tries to, to, to find the way in. The good news is now that these hackers depend on communication, right? So you can see this communication goes over the firewall. So with this, the firewall is in the right spot. The firewall is the right device to prevent these attacks. And with watching this video, the likelihood that you already have chosen the right vendor is very good as well, okay? So now you just need to learn how to set it up in the right way to effectively protect against modern cyber threats. And this is what I would like to help you with. And by the way, if you're interested in security best practices for Palo Alto Networks, then check out the blog on our webpage. Here in the best practice section, you can download this worksheet with over 120 best practices for the next generation firewall. And very soon, we will also launch a security best practice training with a lot of videos explaining all of these security best practices in detail. So if you're interested, then sign up to our mailing list and we will let you know as soon as this free training is available.